On this edition of InCycle, we'll find out what connects cycling with religion in Belgium. The exhibition is set up in ways that you can follow. Pilgrimage, actually, which takes you past 10 cycling chapels. Which are the deals that make the peloton go round? It's that time of year again. It's transfer season. The uh, second rest day of the tour, it's probably the biggest transfer day of the year. Maybe these contracts aren't getting signed, but there's deals getting done. But first, the Women's World Tour conquers the Col d'Isoir at La Course. I think it's a massive opportunity for any of the real climbers in the peloton. The women cycling, there aren't really that many opportunities for them. So if you're a, you know, a purist, then it's a race for you, I think. I only know what my parents have told me. They rode, rode up it yesterday. Uh, Dad said it wasn't that hard. Mum said it was really hard. So uh, <laughs> that's about as much as I know. It's the first time in my career that uh, we can do a climb like that and I'm so excited to start there. Um, I think I was here with the age of 13 or 14 with my parents for holiday and actually it's like a dream to be now here for racing. I think for all of us it's just to, um, to soak up the experience and, and the vibe and the atmosphere. Ready yesterday we saw all the camper vans parked and people getting ready um, to support the tour. So I think um, that's going to be something really different. And yeah, our objective is just to soak it all up and see what comes from that. This isn't a part of the world that we come to very often. And um, it's one of the first time I've really raced properly in the Alps. We saw the Motorola last year in the Giro, but that's the closest thing I think we've seen to this long of a climb. And so it really is um, a, a new, new territory, new challenge for us. Uh, there, there are still 40 so or so kilometers of, I think, somewhat difficult racing before we actually hit the final climb. It, it, could, it could be aggressive with people trying to get up the road early, um, and then it'll really be interesting to see how the quote-unquote hill climbers tackle such a long climb. Quite certain that there are teams that aren't so confident to leave it all for the final climb, so I'm imagining, you know, some attacks and quite aggressive racing from the start. Linda Willemsen goes on the attack. Great to see her back racing, the former world champion of the time trial and New Zealand up. You don't want to let her go. In Gilestre, it's already going up quite hard in the city, in the village. And um, later it uh, has a bit more of a flat part with the tunnels. And after the tunnels, you, you start going up already in the valley, turn left, and then the climb really starts. As we see this group, this little trio, but it looks to me like Lizzie Dignan is just riding this one back. She's not too worried at, at all about what is happening. For the first time, Linda Willemsen looks around and sees the peloton just behind her and realizes that her time in the lead is over. And then I think we're gonna see some fireworks. 9K to go. This pace is absolutely prolific here by Lizzie Dignan. She's literally riding the riders off her wheel. It's a case of suffering, really. Climbing is all about suffering. I mean, obviously, physiology comes into it, but psychologically, um, it's a massive challenge. It's all about suffering for about an hour, I think. I think it's also a lot about pacing, you know. Um, if you go once, too far into the red, you never come out of it on a climb like that. So I think it's about keeping that in mind. But of course, there's going to be some girls that I think are, are willing to just put it all out there. This is the attack from Annemiek van Vleuten, who ups the tempo. She's decided it's time to go. I think you need to know your point of suffering very well. 
And uh, yeah, for sure, it's also something similar to time trialing. I think you really need to feel this and you need to know yourself and your body very well to do that in a good way. And now another big attack. It comes from Annemiek van Vloyt and Warwicka Scott. She ups the tempo, 4.4 kilometers to go. You come out of the woods and you, you, yeah, you cross a little uh, top and actually you come out into another world where you are kind of a desert and yeah then you can see already the top where you have to go where you have the switchbacks and where the finish line will be the longer you you're involved in the sport and maybe the more competitive you become you start to realize that actually at the at the top end of competition it's it's sometimes more mental than what it is physical you know of course the physical aspect is is very important and, and talent and training and all that kind of stuff um, plays a big role but at the end of the day that small minor differences in terms of, of marginal gains or small percentages that often comes down to the mental sides. Annemiek van Vleuten is going to win this stage of La Course by Le Tour de France on the famed Isouard. An incredible climb. Second place is going to be Lizzie Dignan. I had my mum's uh, sort of words of wisdom in the back of my mind. She said that the bit through the trees was the hardest. So once I was through the trees, I was like, right, got mum's advice, I'm all right. In Holland, everyone's still talking about Leontie van Morsel. Years ago, that she was winning on the Alpe d'Huez, and uh, I, uh, I hope that uh, this kind of finish uh, that uh, people also will talk about it, and that they will continue to talk about it. Like maybe you can next year have a stage race or something. It's not a game today. It's just uh, to be the strongest uphill and the strongest did win today. And I'm really happy and proud that it was me today. Visit Flanders and many will tell you that to them, cycling is their life. In fact, cycling is a religion is a statement that the Rusolara Cycling Museum proudly portrays at its latest exhibition. While the museum's original site is undergoing refurbishment, what better temporary home than the Father's Church of Rusolara? My name is Louise de Bravandere and I work here in the Wieler Museum in Rusolara. My name is uh, Dries de Zaiteit. I am the museum's uh, researcher. I think we show around uh, 40 bikes. The oldest bike is from the 1930s. All the, the great riders are uh, represented. We show, I think, around 60 uh, jerseys. They represent uh, the, the, the whole history of cycling from the beginning until now. There are 160 portraits of cyclists. They are a part of a book that we wrote about the exhibition. We inhabited the church with brand new exhibition, Kurs is Religi, so cycling is a religion. The exhibition is set up in ways that you can follow. Pilgrimage, actually, which takes you past 10 cycling chapels. You see every year the, the Tour of Flanders, it's here in Belgium. The cyclists are crazy about this race. This is the, the race of the year. The biggest one, we think, in, the, in Flanders is Koolskamp Kurs. It's the championship of Flanders, so it's a bit different than the uh, Tour of Flanders. It's around the city of Koolskamp, which is quite big here in, uh, in Flanders. We devoted the fifth chapel to uh, Eddy Merckx, who is one of our own famous uh, Flandriens. He's represented there with his bicycle and a, an icon of him. It's uh, the poster child for many campaigns, there's songs about him, there, there are books, there are uh, pictures, there's just everything about him. You see pictures of, of Eddie Marx, phrases of the Giro were welcomed by the Pope. Even the Vatican has their own um, cycling team, which is uh, Amore Vita, and the Pope is like an honorary member of, uh, of the team. He has their own, his own uh, membership card hanging here, which is pretty cool actually. So uh, Van den Broek, he is represented here uh, with, with some jer jerseys, but also with a, a trophy, his trophy of Liège, Baston in Liège in 1999. He was very, very talented, but he had also a lot of rock and roll. They know his story with drugs, women. Here in Belgium, people, they forgive guys, guys like Van den Broek such mistakes, which gives these guys more and more the, the statue of a god. So our uh, ninth chapel is the confession booth. It's Lance Armstrong who's confessing his doping usage in the Tour of France. Yes or no? Okay. 
we, we show also two jerseys, one of the, the Festina team, who is of course linked with the Tour de France 1989. Team Soigneur Willy Wood, who was caught on, on the French border with his car full of dope. Another shirt is from the Givis team. The Ten Chapel is actually my favorite chapel. It's all about superstitions. The number 13 for a lot of people is a bad number. Uh, so most cyclists spell the number upside down on their on their jersey. We have an uh, example of that from Cancellara. There's the superstition about the uh, rainbow jersey as well. The rainbow jersey is the bearer of bad luck for some cyclists. There are a lot of examples like Tom Simpson, uh, who was a world champion, and then Jean-Pierre Monsery, who also won the, the rainbow jersey and died the next year. So they say there is a big curse around the rainbow jersey. I think nowadays the attention to, to religion is very downsized in France. For, for many people, um, they see Peter Sagan maybe as, as a surrogate for the real God. As a, you can see pictures of, of, for example, Sagan after he won Tour de Flanders. He stood up on, on the team car. People were cheering him just like he was a God. Religion is quite big in the cycling world. The Tour de France can be busy and chaotic. Three weeks of hard work and pressure. And while the eyes of most fans are fixed on the battle for the yellow jersey, around the team buses and hotels, an entirely different side of the sport is playing out. The transfer season is fast approaching and the race for rider contracts hotting up. A lot of stuff goes on during the Tour de France, that's for sure. It's a, it's a fast, uh, fast moving event from a business side uh, aspect and, and from a sporting side. There are lots of conversations happen now, so rider agents come and they talk to the teams and ask which, you know, which kind of type riders you're looking for, climbers or GC contenders or sprinters or whatever. And then, you know, I guess the conversations happen and then from 1st of August, yeah, it's a busy time of the year. Like for the rest day for me yesterday was, I had meetings from like literally eight in the morning till close to midnight. So it's a busy time. So who exactly are team bosses of the peloton facing on the opposite side of the table? To find out, InCycle went in search of the sometimes mysterious character, the rider agent. With over 100 agents licensed and certified by the UCI, not all of them are unfamiliar faces to cycling fans. Hi, I'm Baden Cook and I'm a rider agent. Uh, well, I wasn't really expecting to retire at the end of 2013, so uh, I thought I had another couple of good years in me. So it was a kind of a uh, bit of a surprise when I didn't get renewed by Orica. Um, I had an idea in the back of my head for to, to become an agent, a rider agent, um, but not that, not so soon. I'm Drew Smets. I'm the agent of many riders in the peloton. We represent around 60 guys, of which the main ones are Michael Matthews, uh, current green jersey holder here at the Tour de France, uh, Philippe Gilbert, uh, winner of Tour of Flanders this year, Greg van Avermaet, Olympic champion, winner of Roubaix, uh, Daniel Stibar, uh, runner-up in Roubaix. So we, uh, we have been around for about 18 years uh, with our agency called Celio Sport and Image, and uh, I took over at the beginning of this year. I've been doing the job for 11 years now. So um, yeah, we're one of the main agencies for rider management in the peloton. There is far, far more rules and regulations than you would expect. And uh, certainly many would assume that being a professional bike rider, you would know all the rules and regulations. And I can tell you that's not the case at all. Um, the, the, the rule book for the agents uh, is, is uh, quite extensive and it, it took me, I, I studied uh, for two months solid to pass the test. They're officially allowed to start signing riders from the 1st of August. Um, that's, the, the transfer period starts then and that's when, when you know, a, lot of, a lot of riders are announced. For example, yesterday, the uh, second rest day of the tour, it's probably the biggest transfer day of the year. Maybe contracts aren't getting signed, but there's deals are getting done. Agreements are being made verbally, and people are pretty much knowing where they're going to go. And then basically everyone waits for the, the 1st of August to sign the contracts and they go from there. Obviously we're here now at the Tour de France. This is, uh, I would say, the, the most busy period of the year and that 
is as far as goes the, the contract negotiations with teams. Because teams are now starting to fill up their rosters for next year, so we are around and we meet up with team managers just to try and, and position our riders uh, with those teams and uh, you know see what, what teams are interested in them and, um, and at, at what financial level uh, we're, we're talking. In cycling, you can only uh, negotiate contracts for riders who are at the end of their contract in the current year. Uh, so we do not go and sell riders that still have a year contract or even more left with their, uh, with their current team. Uh, that's different to other sports such as football, for example, where you can really do transfers being in a contract. That's not the case in cycling. So at the beginning of the year, we know which of our riders are uh, at the end of their contracts uh, with their team. Um, then we talk with them and we see are they happy on their current team or would they rather go and look elsewhere and then see which teams they would be interested in. And then our job is to go and talk with those team managers and obviously also see if there's an interest from their side because it needs to be a mutual uh, interest uh, in order to be able to conclude a contract. And so basically we explain to the team manager of, the, of those teams uh, what the position of the rider is, um, also sometimes you know, if things go well, you can talk about the good results, but sometimes riders have had some difficult times and then you can explain why. Now, while you'd expect an agent to be enemy number one of any team boss, do a quick survey and it suggests otherwise. Generally speaking, it's a good thing to have sort of an intermediary that that's uh, you know that, that that the rider views as a completely objective source. Um, I mean, I, it's not to say that I've never gotten into it with an agent. I mean, clearly I have. I mean, you develop an emotional connection with the riders on the race and training them and coaching them and you know so on and so forth, and then all of a sudden you get to the to discussing money and that emotional connection can really erode. Um, having an intermediary where you can just negotiate in a business level and not on a on a you know a friendship coaching whatever level is I think really helpful. Obviously you try always to make the good negotiation for both parties because the win-win is always the best uh, the best solution. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not easy, but uh, it's part of the job that we need to deal with. They can be sometimes the devils of the industry, but I mean for the most part they you know they they individuals that focus and look after riders and they they want the maximum and the best for the for their riders and so we, you know we deal with them on a daily basis I guess during a Tour de France like this when you're trying to define your strategy for the next year and who's on the market and who's not and you know trying to plug some holes in as a team so yeah I mean we we engage with them often and all that we've lost a, you know we've got a rider that is leaving our team now that is that we didn't want to lose and it was oh, it was a it wasn't a nice process that we we went through but it is what it is I guess so some are understanding and care about the culture of a team and that a, and a riders fit into that and then some are you know, pretty hostile and, and it can be, you know, it can be a real bad process. In cycling, I think we all try to respect the rules and uh, team managers also, they respect the rules and, and that matter. So it's a very, I, I think it's a very um, correct business we, we, we do, as opposed to sometimes in the stories you hear from other sports. Um, and, and it makes it in a way easier because um, we don't have to go and try and sell riders, although they still have a contract, but, you know, try to get them out of there to make money on the transfer and stuff like that. No, it's you work for you, or well, you work for all your riders, but you you go and try and find a deal, a contract deal for riders that are out of contract. It's as simple as that. So it's a very controlled market. You've got 18 World Tour teams. You've got around 18 or 20 Pro Continental teams, and that's it. That's the whole market. So uh, in football, you've got thousands of, of uh, football teams all around the world. So it's very less controlled. The relationship between rider and agent varies greatly, and it's one that extends far beyond the negotiating table. We also take care of their taxes, um, insurances, uh, administration problems, residency issues, uh, which, which uh, is uh, becoming more and more an issue for a lot of guys, for Australians, for Americans coming over to Europe, getting a visa uh, done for them. So we really try to give them a full service package, uh, not just only negotiating their team contract and then, you know, bye bye and see you again in, in two years' time when your contract runs out, but really being there on, on a daily basis for them for any problem they might have linked to their profession. Some riders are needy and some riders. Uh, only need you. Only need to speak to you in, in uh, contract time when it's trans. When it's the transfer period, they they want to know everything. Then, the rest of the time, they don't want to talk to you. Some guys need uh, you know they need to talk to you all the time, just about personal stuff. And and you know I end up being friends with most of them, so that's not a not an issue.
Such is the financial instability of cycling, there are conditions that put agents under pressure. And the 2016 season, when two World Tour teams ceased to exist, was certainly one of those. When you're a rider, when you're an agent, and even when you're a fan, it's always a pity to see big teams fold. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's things that, you know, give, give uh, riders reason not to sleep at night when, you know, you do the math, there's two teams stopping, there's only one starting, that's 30 guys going to be out of jobs and then you, you consider that each team takes on three or four young guys, so that's, eight, you know, 18 times four more guys that are going to be pushed out the other end who are older. Um, you know, you've, everyone's always doing the mathematics, where am I going to be? Am I going to have a team? Am I, am I going to have to drop down to Pro Continental? Um, and it's really, really stressful. That's also one of the parts of our job is to know what the, what the market looks like. And so at the beginning of the year, we already know with, due to our contacts and, and, and the, way, uh, the, the, the way that we can get that information, we know which teams will uh, have to look for new sponsorship for the upcoming year. So we can already see you know, what the, that, that's going to bring on the market um, as an effect. And so last year, for example, we knew that there were IAM and Tinkoff that were the two teams that were uh, in danger, I would say, for the upcoming year. So then you try to anticipate that by trying to finalize contracts as soon as possible, because you know that the longer the season will take, the bigger the chance will be that everybody will see the effects on the market. This year, uh, it's, it's a lot more stable. Um, all of the World Tour teams will continue for next year. Um, there was one question mark, which was Quick Step, but uh, it seems very likely that they're going to continue, so that's, that's okay. So all the, the World Tour teams continue. There's a few pro-continental teams, that's the second division, that might even increase their budget. So this year is a good, is a good market for the riders. And with August the 1st fast approaching, that market is about to reopen. That's all for this week. Join us next time on InCycle, but until then, keep up to date with us on social media.